Thank you, very, thank you very much for that rousing applause. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you for stroking the ego. And welcome to the graveyard. This is the graveyard session. Excuse me. Did you get, did you get it? Great. Um, hi guys, my name is Nick Rabinovitz. And um, <clears throat> is, it, is it warm enough? I just want to check it's warm enough for you guys in here. We've been working on the... Adjusting the, is it okay? Is it hot enough for you? It's too hot. That's to remind you that we are in a drought. We are in a drought and I was recently in Utah. So I can tell you the drought uh, is caused by gay marriage. And it's just important to know. To, to, to know that we have to say, do you know that this morning guys, I collected the grey water. Just had a grey water uh, system installed. So we collect the water from the toilet and the bath and the shower and then we drink it. But it tastes, okay, it tastes cut. But if you add Oryx, it actually tastes worse. You have to add clippies, that's the secret. Clippies, and then if you have enough clippies, uh, you forget which one of your kids pissed in the bath. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't worry. So, I wanted to talk about success in the context of being an entertainer, which uh, unfortunately, there's this automatic association as the performer with, with, with being famous. And, and I had a, a recent epiphany uh, regarding this, I was driving to the Boer Cup. Anybody not been to the Boer Cup? Anybody not been there to the Boer Cup? Yes, you sir. You need to take a trip up there today. Actually, this afternoon. So you know what I'm talking about? On the cobblestones, history, the, the, the first freed slaves went there, 1850. Those cobblestones are still there, which means the roads are badly marked, which is how I ended up going through a four-way stop without realizing it. But also, I was, I was on my phone. But I, so, but I wasn't talking on the phone. I was Instagramming because the houses are so beautiful. Hashtag no filter. And I went straight through and I didn't notice a car coming down. And, uh, and uh, I just went straight through. And then I, about a minute later, I saw somebody tailing me as I parked. He double parked next to me, started shouting through the window. What the hell you do? Go to the car. You don't look my brother. I'm coming down. You're going this way. Huh? You're lucky I'm going slow. I'm going 20, but with gravity plus the modifications. Because I took the car last week to Jandira, was in the Vrijwilge Lichtkamps gesnijd, button clutch, and a befakte loader gesit. Okay, he never said that, but I could see from, I could see from the car that, that he had, and I just was apologizing profusely, and he was like, don't be sorry, you must be careful, and then he just stopped midway, and, and looked at me and went, oh my goodness, Nick Rabatingswatch. The comedian. My bird, I'm so sorry. I didn't recommend you. I was like, no, it's fine. And he was like, I'm such a big fan of yours. Last week I sent your DVD to Iraq, to my cousin in Iraq. And I was like, that's amazing. Your cousin in Iraq? Yes, he said, everybody saw. Everyone in Iraq did see your DVD. You must not go to Iraq. Nick, you must not go to Iraq. They put the fatwa out on you. I was like, what DVD was this? He said, no, it's from that show you're doing now, at the moment, there by the Baxter. I was like, that show's not on DVD. He was like, well, it is now. I was like, that's piracy. He was like, well, if you're going to let that go, I will let this go. Then he said to me, my brother, do you mind if we take a selfie? I thought, well, it's the least I can do. I've almost caused an accident. I got out the car. He said, cool, I'll take a selfie. Then he handed the phone to his passenger and said, Mohammed, fat a selfie for Nick and take a selfie for me and this guy. I was like, I don't know if I should point out that eventually I was like, you know, technically that's not going to be a selfie if he's taking the, the picture of us. And he was like, well, technically it's not my phone. <laughs> and then he asked Muhammad another question. He said, Muhammad, can you do Do you know for this guy? And I don't think Muhammad did because he just said, Vizdi night, which is Afrikaans for who this attractive young guy that I've never met. That's the level of fame I have reached in Cape Town. For some people it's Nick Rabanik switch, for other people it's Vizdi Night. And it got me thinking, you know, because when I started out 16 years ago, seven, almost 17 years ago, uh, one of the first things I did was in TV. And, uh, and t people see people on TV and they, they're like, oh my God, I see you on TV. That's like, you, you're a man. And this you happened to me a lot, cause, but mainly at petrol stations. And uh, like, for example, if I ask 
Did any of you see the Coca-Cola Mega Millions game show in 2003? Did you? Did? No, because white people never saw that show, except by accident. Right? Did you, did you see? Yes, you saw the show. You never saw the show. <laughs> Afrikaans people, that's the one exception. White Afrikaans people sometimes come to me and say, yeah, I saw it, because it was before the Afrikaans news. So they'd be, yeah, I saw it. I called my wife, Henrietta, come kijk eens op. What's the kakas, Dina? Come kijk eens op. That's a cosa fucking albino. And then Rian Kraybach and would read the news afterwards, right? For those of you who don't know him, he'd been reading the news since 1839, a year after the Great Trek. And he used to stand behind, sit behind a glass window, and then we would get busy with a two and a half minute game show where you had to pick a number between one and 20 and win money. I'm not proud of this shit, guys. I'm just telling you what happened. Okay? We were in a studio about the size of this. People had sent in 16 million envelopes. The envelopes were like this high. We'd pick one, we'd throw them in the air, and then we'd catch the envelope, phone the person, and then play. Two and a half minutes, and then Rian would read the news. If you're running late, he'd be like, just stay free for a niche, okay? And then you knew it was time to finish up, right? You didn't have one of these, you just had to go. And then I'll never forget the night we got Tempe from Google Letu. The phone rang, and then the contestant would talk in my left ear, the director would talk into my right. The phone rang, Tempe answered, Hi, this is Tempe, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. You know those people who answer their own questions. I was like, hi Tembi, it's Nick here from the Coca-Cola Mega Millions Game Show. Tembi was like, Kubana Tata? I was like, it's Nick, Coca-Cola. Nick, what's your Coca-Cola? I'm like, yes. And then she was like, yeah! Chimichiza! Running around the house, screaming at family members. I only had like two minutes left. I had to calm the woman down. I was like, Tembi, please calm down. I only got two minutes left. Do you know how to play the game? Yes, that was. I know, I know, must lala, let's play. I can play. I'm like, okay, great. I explained to her there was like a board like this, 20 numbers. I'm like, okay, you're going to choose your first number, Timmy, between 1 and 20. What is your number going to be? And Timmy was like, Nick, I'm called, I, 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 I don't understand. I thought maybe it's a language issue. I broke into the vernac. I was like, okay, my man, I'm going to choose the number. You're going to pagat, kwa, wad, not 20. You're going to choose your first number now between 1 and 20. Okay? Problem was when I went back to English, I forgot to change my accent back. Then I heard the director in my other ear, Nick, please don't use that accent. It's racist and condescending. If you could just use your normal accent. Thank you. I'm like, tell me, please, we're running out of time. What is your number between 1 and 20? Tell me, like, okay, Nick, don't worry. Just relax. I understand. Hello, number 27. I'm like, my man, I'm not. In number, in number, Pakadi, ne? Choose a Pakadi, Kwa 1, not 20. Okay, you're only choosing numbers between one and two. Nick, your second warning, I told you, do not use that accent. All right, this is your final warning. Right, like, tell me, please, we've got 45 seconds. What is your number between one and two? And Tim is like, Nick, ah, okay, don't write it. I'm going for 44. I run over to the board. I'm like, my man, I said, you want to know what? Do you see what? She's like, yes. I'm like, you want to 20. Do you see 20? She's like, yes. I'm like, choose that. one. Not 20. You only choosing the numbers between one and Nick, your third and final fucking warning. I'm like, tell me, what is your number? <laughs> Finally, tell me, he's like, okay, Nick, I'm number eight. I want number eight. I'm like, why don't you ask for that in the beginning? She goes, oh, I was just fucking with you. <laughs> I heard Gary talking about midlife crises earlier, and I wrote a show last year about turning 40. It was called Fortified. And, uh, and I actually had some form of, of midlife crisis, but I decided to just uh, stall it a bit because as a man, and uh, middle-aged men will know what I'm talking about, it's a very expensive uh, thing to have a midlife crisis. You end up having to buy a sports car or a mountain bike or fuck your secretary. And I don't have a secretary, so I, I realized I'd have to have sex with a waitress from Seattle and we really don't get on. So actually, I decided not to. And, um, and then my wife fell pregnant like a month later and then I decided well definitely if anyone's going to have a midlife if anyone's going to have a crisis right it's her time to shine and it's my job to support her and since then I have like every time I see a cup of coffee in the morning on the counter and she's not there I just I drop a zone off I walk off nobody knows I'm there she's happy it's great and then um, and then what happened was uh, I was spending a lot of time away at the same time I was traveling and then we had three kids which is a lot, uh, it's just a lot of, thank God she's been spared, but it's just a lot of children. And, um, and there's no time anymore. You have to, young people without kids, where are you guys? You don't have kids? Yeah, 
you got to enjoy enjoy that time you can just go to the bathroom and just scroll through your apps for like four and a half hours to circulate through facebook twitter instagram tinder whatever, whatever your choice is uh, you do that and enjoy it because when you have three children you only get 10 seconds it's like they know they don't even have a counter they just know after 10 seconds to knock on the door dada what you making dada what you make and then you spend like what you what what's your i met you earlier but i've forgotten your your name young man what guy what is your favorite day of the weekend are you a friday man or a saturday guy you're a friday you know what my favorite day of the weekend is monday Okay, Sundays up there with the kids. I spent like 18 hours with a four-year-old the other day playing I Spy. I put him in the bath at six o'clock. He's like, Dada, I Spy with my little eye, something beginning with B. I'm like, the bath? He goes, no, elephant. How am I gonna win at that? Okay, by seven o'clock, I popped my escape. I'm like, love, I'm going to the, to buy dog food. She's like, the dog's eaten. I'm like, I know, but he looks hungrier. She's like, well, the, the, the pet shop's closed. I was like, I'm going to the chemist. She's like, the chemist's closed. I'm like, I'll go to Joburg. And technically I could because I'm going to work. Well, they think I'm working, but I go to sleep in Joburg. It's wonderful. And then I have to pretend I'm having a bad time. And then my wife will phone and go, how's Joburg? And then I'll be like, well, the, the crime is awful. And um, I got arrested on the car train for chewing gum. And then pounded the gum. And then the pillows are really hard. And then she, and don't forget one day she said to me, well, did anyone wake you up in the middle of the night? And I said, no. And she said, well, then shut the fuck up. We know you're having a good time. Enjoy your time. Come back and do your time. And then I felt like things were actually much better after that. We had a level of, Dr. E will tell you, like when you introduce honesty like that in a relationship, it's just, it's awkward at first. It's uncomfortable, right? But then later, and it wasn't much later, it was a few hours later, she texted me, would you like phone sex? I'd never had phone sex. I've heard you talking, I've heard it's a wonderful thing, but I was a bit nervous. She phoned me. She clearly had done it before because she was like, hi. And I was like, hi. She's like, what are you, what are you wearing? I was like, well, my, my, my pajamas? She's like, what do they smell like? And I'm like, well, they're just freshly laundered. There's no bits of dried milk or vomit or anything. She's like, well, what is the, the hotel room like? And I was like, well, the, the floor is uh, clean. There's no toys. There's no bits of food. She was like, oh. She's like, what else are you doing? I was like, I just took a bath and um, nobody came in. I left the door open. Nobody came inside. She was like, oh. She's like, what are you doing now? I was like, I'm just laying my head on the... And then I felt bad that I was in the hotel. So then the next week for our anniversary, I said, we're going to go to a hotel. Just you and me. We leave the kids. We left the boys, the two boys with their grandparents and the baby. I don't know what we did with it. It's a third child. They look after themselves. And then we went. And this weird thing happened, guys, at the hotel. I want, like, I don't want to... It's in the southern suburbs. I don't want to mention any names. Uh, the Vineyard. The Vineyard Hotel. And uh, we checked in at 2 o'clock, and about 6 o'clock, we heard a knock on the door. Housekeeping! And we were like, hello, we, we're here! And housekeeping! No, we're inside! Housekeeping! And then the, she just walked right in. We were in the bed, we were like, hi! And she was like, would you just like a turn down? We were like, what? A turn down? We were like, what? sorry, what's a turn down? No, I just make the bed nice. I turn it for you. I make like an envelope here on the side. We said, no, we're using it at the moment. I was expecting her to leave. No, she walked out like towards the, like right up to the bed and she was like, okay, so you don't want to turn down. We were like, no. And then she looked at us for like five very uncomfortable seconds and went, it's lovely to see this. Lovely to see intimacy. It's a beautiful thing. Lovely. My husband and me were married now 34, 35, 35 years. But he didn't want in a long time. Fuck off. Nothing. And, and that's how we conceived the third child. It's actually interesting because, because our first child, and parents, you have to understand, guy, when you have a kid, like I don't know if you want to have kids or not, but like what happens is, you do at some point, right? What happens, you have to understand birth. There's a very powerful, very powerful chemical, so my, my right ladies who've given birth, oxytocin being one of them, it's like secretion, this very dopamine-like drug that, that bonds the mother and child. So when the baby comes up, there's this exchange of oxytocin, right? As a result, the mother pours all of her love onto the child, right? While the father, Richard, pours all of his love onto a pillow for, um, or, a, or a, I meant a tissue, but I said pillow. I don't know why, it's a Freudian slut. I, I just meant it like that. That's how, and I just fucked that joke up. Totally. Nobody laughed. They normally do. And 
That's what happens in comedy. You fail. Seven, 77 innings, 77 gigs at a time. I just got no laughs. And then I scored 50 on the other five. So, and then they said I had a wonderful career, but I didn't. But the thing is, the, th <laughs> the thing is that uh, we actually conceived our first child, uh, and that's very romantic when you think of having a first child. You don't know anything about the process. Yeah, and I suggested that basically we go to the Cedarburg and, uh, and we conceived Ben on a rock in the Cedarburg because we're Bush Jews. We're not your God variety, 12th generation Woolworths Jews. Okay, we're, we're Bush Jews. So. I was actually conceived at the West Coast on a beach called Lightland. I call it Lightland, but my parents told me it was called Lightland. And so as a result, uh, we conceived on a rock. It was actually my idea. Uh, and because uh, Dr. Eve, well, you have suggested, I mean, outdoor sex is a beautiful thing. And I thought it was wonderful. Thought she was enjoying it. She was like, oh. And then I eventually was like, are you loving this, babe? And then she was like, no, I'm uncomfortable. And I was like, why? She's like, there's something going into me. And I was like, oh, no. She said, it's a rock. I was like, thank you, because you should accept a compliment. And, <laughs> and Ben was born nine months later. And then Adam, remarkably, was born two and a half years later. I don't know how, because we hadn't had sex in that time. And um, so we went to the guy in the college and he did some tests. He said, your wife's hyper fertile. I said, what, what, what does that mean? He said, you've got to take precautions if you don't want a third child really stringent precautions. I was like, like what? And he said, well, I need to ask you some questions, Nick. I said, sure, go ahead. He said, you masturbate frequently? I said, I don't understand how that relates to Debbie's fertility. <laughs> and he wrote down, masturbate frequently. And then he asked, do you masturbate in the shower? And I was like, this is really inappropriate and irrelevant to what we're dealing with here in terms of her infant, uh, like hyperfertility. And then he was like, masturbate in the shower. And I said, how, what are you getting at? He said, well, you see, given your wife's hyperfertility, right, if you're masturbating within 16 feet of her at the time of ovulation, there is a 60 to 70% chance she's going to fall pregnant. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's how... Basically, I said, cool, and then I forgot this information. All right? And then three months later, we were renovating the bathroom and we moved the shower a foot closer to the bed. And that's how our third child was conceived. And then all of a sudden we were in the labor ward, five o'clock in the morning, holding this, this beautiful, this little thing, and uh, a girl. We had two boys, 80% likely to have another boy. I think those are the statistics. And my wife said, you know, it's a miracle that we had a girl. And I looked at her and my comedic brain kicked in. And I said, well, yeah, I mean, it is. But how much of a miracle? I mean, we've got seven billion people on the planet. Now. This is the most common miracle of all the miracles nowadays. Right? I mean, not like in the old days, a miracle was a man walking on the water, burning bush this I mean how I like Cork Bay Fishhook Main Road free of roadworks that's a miracle this I said if I had a vasectomy and then you were born that would have been because I researched it, the vasectomy they call it having the tubes tight that's something some of the guys here need to think about at this age around right about this age having the tubes tied and you can YouTube it because it's a misleading term having the tubes tied. They don't just tie the tubes, right? They actually take the tube up, called the vas deferens. Right, yeah. And thank God you're here, Dr. E. And they take it up, and they cut it, they snip it with a little Swiss Army knife, because it's very, very small. And, and then they bring in a welder. You, they don't tell you this when you go for the consultation, but they bring a welder in with one of those welding hats, and the welding gun, and then they seal the ends of those things. Tight! Like, And then they tied that shit, put it back, put it back in there, and uh, and then I didn't realize this, but everything operates the same, everything, right? You have sex, it's all the you don't. There's not a vast difference in the way you experience anything. That is the worst joke in my talk, but my personal favorite. And then you even ejaculate in the same way. I was like, what happens to those sperm? What happens to them? They get shot up. Because it's a cul de sac. <laughs> that is the experience of turning 40, guys. That is what it's like. You start thinking about life. You start thinking about death as well. My four year old the other day asked me, Dad, what, what happens when we die? And it was actually a day after his sister was named, which was a very traumatic day for him. Because he said to me, Dad, what are we going to do with the baby? And I said, we're going to take her to the synagogue. And the rabbi 
is going to give her a name. And he said, and then, is he going to cut off a bit of her pipi? I said, no, that's primitive and barbaric. We only do that to you. We went to the shul the next day. We named the baby. She made a poo during the naming ceremony. Uh, to change her immediately afterwards, I went to a room next door. Are you taking notes on, on my tour? Excellent. And then, as I was changing her, I took the nappy off. As the four-year-old ran in, looked at this and went, Dada, they cut off the whole pipi. You can quote me on that. And then, that night, he says to me, Dad, what happens when we die? And I said, well, that's the burden of being a Jew. We go to Pinelands. He said, what happens there? I said, well, they put you in a hole in the ground, throw sand in your face. That's it for you, my friend. Then they go out for lunch or dinner. And he was like, and then, and then what? I said, well, we don't really know, but some people think you have a soul, and the soul goes to heaven. He thought about this five minutes later. He said, Dad, so when you die and your soul goes to Kevin, who, who is Kevin? I said, he's an estate agent. I didn't know what to say. Then he asked me, what happened to Opa? Because his grandfather died before he was born, unfortunately. And I said, well, Opa, he was very ill and he had a heart condition. He had angina. And then he said, what? Opa had angina? I said, no, he had angina. You know, like, he had a pipi, but he had angina. It's like confusing. He said, oh, like custard. And I was like, what? And he was like, custard semenya. And I was like, where the fuck do you get that? That is very inappropriate. And then he's like, yeah, but what happened to Opa? And I said, well, he had this thing and, you know, my dad actually had his first heart attack at 40, at my age, right? I had to go see the cardiologist just the other day. It's hereditary. I'm on like medication for the shit. And, um, and as a result, he gave up accountancy. Not because of the heart condition, but because it gave him a rash. And then, and then he took up pottery, right? And which was an inspiration for me. Like I studied business science, organizational psychology. And uh, all I remember is that it's like normal psychology, but more organized. I wasn't, I wasn't that good at it so it was better that I went into to comedy and as a result my mom and I have a very close relationship built on guilt and disappointment but that's a whole other talk for a different day but basically my dad took up pottery and then he practiced as a potter on a mountain in Constantia for like the rest of his life at 88 years old he sold the last of the pot which I have now explained to you. otherwise you think he's an 88 year old drug dealer which he wasn't but on the day that he died I went to visit my parents and I had lunch there and, uh, and I borrowed my dad's fleece. I put it on and I took it off at the end of the day. I gave it back to him. But I'd found 10,000 Rand in cash because of selling the last of the pot um, to these people that come from overseas. Like an ex-girlfriend. I could tell she was like putty in his hands. Her eyes were glazing. Those are, those are the only putty jokes I know. So I just put them in there. It's not part of the story. And then I kissed my dad goodbye. Dad, I love you. And, uh, and at that point, you know, when someone's at that stage and they're sick, you know that could be the last moment. We don't operate like that normally. But I went out for dinner with my wife. My mom phoned. Her dad's collapsed. I flew back on the highway. It was too late. He had, you know, walked further than he walked in months to kiss my mom goodnight, come back, had this massive heart attack. And, um, and, and the, the undertakers came, took him. And people, when I tell the story, Des, can you put me back up there? Thanks. When I tell the story, people want to know what happened to the 10,000 Rand. And basically, the, the, under, the Jewish undertakers, they're different from when Christians die. You call the doves, they come. When Muslims die, you don't call anybody. You start digging immediately. Sadiq Mako! And then Sadiq is like, Oh, what's not it? Fine, use a pillow. It's up a date Maghrib. It's just everybody's different. We have the Khev. These are two guys. They look like Laurel and Hardy. They have social anxiety. They come in. First question to my mom, Mrs. Rabinovich, our condolences. We've booked the plot next to him for you. The grave next to him is yours. The debit orders will start coming off next month. Where's the body? I take them there. We take my dad to a panel van, right? I'm like, do the bodies always weigh this much when they... He says, yes, but this is nothing. We did a removal in Clifton last week. The guy was 200 kgs, 300 steps. My back's fucked. Put my dad in the panel van, drove off. 20 minutes later, I'm sitting at the table with my mom. I'm like, shit, mom, they took him away in the jacket with a 10 grand in the pocket. And she's like, boy, your father has just passed away. You, you know, we need to just process all of this. And I think what we should do is call them and tell them to come immediately. It's a very awkward phone call. I was like, sorry, guys, we didn't get to say goodbye. We didn't get the closure we needed. Could you just bring him back? 
no, 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 I'm into the house. And then they did. They brought him back and reeled him back out of the panel van. And I was hugging my dad, but like this. And then the undertaker leaned over and said, Sonny, listen, if this is about the money, we put it on the kitchen counter before we took him away. And I was like, thank you, I think we got the closure we needed. And you want to leave. We all want to leave some kind of legacy. And maybe, you know, being famous is not the thing. But in my dad's case, he left this beautiful pottery. And we eat off it. And my kids never met him. But they have all this, these works of art. And it's, it's fantastic. I started thinking, like, what legacy will I leave in this world? I know my kids know what I do. But my grandkids, what will they discuss about me one day? Yeah, our grandpa was like, a, yeah, he's a, what is he again? A clown. Yeah, he's a clown. And the other one's like, no, he's a magician. He was definitely, a, like, you just don't know. Like, what are you going to leave behind? And then you get to, like, great-grandkids, you know? And then they end up, like, you end up like that grave when you drive down past Krudeskia on your left. And the pick-and-pay observatories on your right. And those forgotten graves, just, like, always a bit of KFC in the wind, just like this. I'll be like that, and then my great-grandkids will pick up a faded picture of me in a box one day and go, Viz Dine? Like, you don't know. You don't know how, how it's going to end, but it's going to end in 3 minutes and 28 minutes. It will end. And if you ever get invited to, if you've ever been to a Jewish funeral in Pines, man, no. If you ever get, maybe it will be my, who knows? We don't know how it's going to end. We, I could end up like a 42-year-old girl. You know those guys? They go for a job, 0% body fat, no bad cholesterol. they friends of Tim Noakes, haven't eaten toast in 20 years. Five minutes into his job, bang, gets hit by a flying air conditioner. You don't know how it's going to end. If you ever get invited, don't take directions to the Jewish cemetery from a Jew. You will get lost. You will take the wrong off ramp, you will turn right instead of going over the bridge in Pinewoods. You will end up at the accounts department in Old Mutual applying for a job you don't even want. Use Google Maps, okay? And then you get there, turn the phone off. It happened to a friend of mine. She arrived as they were lowering the coffin. Everybody heard the voice from her pocket. You have reached your final destination. You don't want to. What is it about? In 2 minutes 25 seconds, this is my conclusion. It's not about the, all the cuck we think it's about fame and achievement. We know this stuff. What is it about? It's often just about the quality of the connections that we leave behind. The footprints we leave on each other's souls, Eleanor Roosevelt said. It's Ubuntu. That's what people are left with at the end of your life. What was the feeling they got? Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Kabantu. Meaning, a person is a person because of other people that made that person and thoroughly enjoyed the process whereby that person was made. Nick, please don't use that accent, it's racist, they can't. No, I'm just saying, guys. It's the welcome that you give people. It's, you know, it's like when you arrive at customs after you've been overseas and you get that over-friendly woman. That's the definition of Ubuntu. We welcome people into this country. They could be criminals. Mr. Kretscher, Mr. Radovan Kretscher. Okay, they see your passport. International drug lord, mafia, assassin, hashtag overachiever. You know what? In the spirit of Ubuntu, they get inside. Hala, hala. We let people in that we maybe shouldn't, you know? Al-Qaeda, or is it Al-Qaeda? Are you guys causa terrorists? Al-Qaeda, huh? Don't worry, get in. I had this beautiful moment, I've been in New York, I came back, and you know when you come back and you want to kiss the tarmac, and you just, things don't work here, and the government's fucked, but you know what, we have this thing of Ubuntu, and there's, you get to the front of that queue at customs, and that lady with the big smile says to me, takes my passport, hello, Mr. Rainbow Wits. Mr. Rapino, you been the one and it's very difficult to say, Mr. Rapino, what what? Can't I just call you Johnny Clark? I'm like, fine. She takes my passport, she scans it, she says, Mr. Clark, you connect out we've got a problem now. I was like, what's the problem? She says, sir, you've got 16,000 runs in traffic fights. I'm like, this is customs, how do you know about that? She's like, I don't, I'm just fucking with you. Remember me, it's Tempe from Mega Millions. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much. You've been wonderful.